You know, there's something in each side of us, deep down in each side of us, and we're not in touch with it all the time. In fact, very rarely. But uh, you know what it's called? It's called your soul. And you know your soul just wants to do all the time? It wants to worship. And it wants to thank and praise God. Because that's what it was created to do. And guess what? That's what it's going to do for eternity. For eternity. So sometimes I, I know that tension is in there. But when you feel that inside, that's what that is. And when you let that worship, it's amazing. Amazing what it can do. Bring healing and strength and power. So I thank you for the leading of worship that you offer when you are here and that we are more mindful of worship. Um, ask you to open your Bible to 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 31 today, because last week we talked about the first part of spiritual gifts. And I know you remember that, those of you who were here. Um, so today we're going to talk about chapter 12 and verses 12 to 31, which is about one body, many parts. Imagine that, the hokey pokey. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would be, it would not, it would, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear were to say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. In other words, just because I said so. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. Well, the presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lack it. So that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have the gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But eagerly desire the greater gift. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Paul given quite a dissertation there. There's a lot to consume, but it's a powerful, powerful piece he's talking about. You know, organ transplants have been a part of our lives and of our society for, for several years. Um, just by checking a box on your driver's license, and I encourage you to pray about it and think about doing that. Um, or adding a line to your wills, our kidneys, our livers, our lungs, our hearts, all of those things can be transplanted to add to the quantity and the quality of, of the lives of people that receive it. Jack Hayes is a recipient, right? Back there, there's a heart, isn't there? Huh? Kathy Miller was a recipient, 
Scott Ayers, um, the recipient of organ transplants, and Adam is right back there, and he gave his kidney for somebody else, then you donated the kidney uh, for a transplant. But in July of 1915, just last year, another transplant took place. It was a giant step when eight-year-old Zion Harvey in Baltimore became the first person to receive a transplant you remember this? Of both hands. Both hands. It was an amazing feat that was celebrated by him and his family and the medical community and others. And there were several articles out that celebrated it. And while they did celebrate that accomplishment, one person, Dr. Dr. L. Scott Levin, reminded us of the cause. He said, this operation was only possible because there was a donor another young boy who had died. He talked about that family's amazing generosity and, and he said, I think the difference is finding a family who has the courage to relinquish the arms of a child who just died and give hope and life and quality of life to a child who is still living. The reports of Zion's amazing hand transplant also mentioned another call. There's another cost that comes with it. To keep his body from rejecting the transplant, this boy will need to take medication the rest of his life. And the side effects of the medication include increased chances of infection and cancer. Doctors and scientists have been working for a long time to uh, eliminate both of those costs. Being able to generate body parts from the patient's own teacher, tissues would eliminate the need for a donor and dramatically increase the body's ability to assimilate those new parts and not reject them. And it may sound like a lot of science fiction to you, but it is starting to happen. You may have heard about some of them. And they're not at the point of regenerating anything as complex as a hand, but scientists have been able, I was doing some research, to generate noses, ears, blood vessels, and, and other small parts in laboratories. This process is amazing. It's amazing. Doctors and scientists, what they do is they create what's called a scaffold. They create a little mold of sorts in a proper shape. And on that scaffold, they place some of the patient's own cells. And then they put them in an environment where the cells are given proper nutrition and a perfect environment for growth. And what happens is the cells multiply and they form a new nose. The scaffold made of biogradable material, this mold is made of biogradable, will eventually disappear. And it'll leave, leave behind a new part, just like your original part. The results are promising. And when they're transplanted onto the patient, the organs have a super low rejection rate. And in many patients, they function just like the original. In other words, this isn't just a cosmetic fix, but a true replacement. Or in the language of a, a mechanic, these are not aftermarket par parts. These are just like the original. In other words, um, they are just like they are part of our own bodies because they are. They come from regenerated parts of our own bodies. And doctors have great hope great hope for this technology, um, like eventually duplicating more complicated body parts like kidneys and lungs and livers and things like that. So it's an amazing technology that's going on that I was reading about. I was thinking uh, about it in relation to what we've been talking about. And in, in Paul's epistle today, the Apostle Paul uses the parts of the body as an illustration for what it means to be the church. And he too is looking for ways for each body part to function best. To function best. And, and the text is a portion of Paul's letter to the church in the city of Corinth. And like every church then and now, it was made up of people who had a variety of gifts. Some of the gifts were preaching and teaching and Others were gifted with mission and service and, and music, and some had a business sense. Others were good at generating wealth for the church, and others had a gift of caring for the home and family and other people. 
but rather in seeing those gifts as a blessing. Here's what's going on at Corinth. The Corinthian church was wondering which of these gifts were better than the others. Isn't that so typical? Huh? They were bickering about position and status, and they were vying for power within the group. I know none of you have ever experienced that. That was a joke. <laughs> Thank you. We know this issue all too well, don't we? It happens just about in every organization that you're involved in, including the church. We expect others to be just like us. And we want our unique giftedness to be appreciated and recognized and praised and acclaimed. And we can uh, uh, easily assume as we read 1 Corinthians that it's Paul's response to the question from the church which had been asked of him to settle this dispute. They wrote him a letter, Paul, help us out, what's the story? Perhaps they asked him which role in the church is most important. And look what he did, instead of ranking the gifts by importance and the gifts of the Spirit. Paul gives an illustration comparing the members of the church to members of the body. A group of believers, he says, is greater than the sum of its parts. We are not some homogenous group, but a group of different parts assembled by God to represent Christ in the greater community. We're not all the same, and that's a good thing. On the surface, it may appear as though the church is a loose collection of people from the same geography, the same area. We all come to the same church every Sunday because it's near our houses. Or maybe we drive by a local church in favor of a distant church because we like the music or we like the pastor or they have better coffee, whatever it is. We attend a Sunday school class. We get involved in a small group and maybe help with the youth group. We might even serve on a committee. And for the most part, we think that it stops there. That's it. We can get involved as much or as little as we choose. And then, then when the church no longer is meeting our needs, or we begin to disagree with the statements that the church is making or the pastor stands for, we can simply stop attending or withdraw or transfer our membership to some other church. We simply detach ourselves from the body and join another if we find that it's a good fit. Sometimes, and maybe this is what was happening in Corinth, um, we find that there are those in the church who don't quite fit. There's those who don't quite fit. Perhaps they have a minority opinion of gifts or the interests and are vastly different from most of the other members of the church. They just don't quite fit in. Maybe a congregation thinks that um, perhaps that it represents a certain political party, or maybe it represents a certain race, or favors one gender over another, men over women, or a particular age group that is part of that church and its identity. When one member senses they are not part of the in-group, they may feel shut out and unwanted. And like a body, that's rejecting a transplant, these members feel cut off from the rest of the group. Church membership or church affiliation is not a responsibility that we ought to be taken lightly. You can't take that lightly. It's, it is different from being in a book club or from joining a gym. We don't just show up to have our needs met. Church membership is not also like some rewards card or some loyalty card at your local grocery store. We don't join it just to receive frequent worship blessings. We are not stockholders whose time and service and financial investment necessarily give us a say in setting the direction of the future of the church. Today's reading Read it over, you've read it before. This reading demands a deeper commitment from all of us. It demands a deeper commitment. In any of those examples, we simply walk away when things are not going our way. When we stop getting what we want, 
We can be as committed or as distant as we see fit. In 1 Corinthians 12, the Bible teaches us that our connection to one another in Christ is so much more. That's the problem. There's so much more. We are eyes, ears, feet, and hands. We are part of the body of Christ. We are dependent on one another, and we function best when we realize that despite our differences, we are working all together for the same goal. <clears throat> of course, Paul would have had no idea about all these wonderful things that they're doing in science to regenerate body parts today, and yet his illustration still works. Um, as the scaffold that he's talking about, the mold provides shape for regenerating a nose or an ear. The same is true of our individual gifts and abilities. They shape us for our uniquely talented gifts to use them within the body of Christ. Our differences are not to be minimized, but to be celebrated. Each of us has a different scaffold. We all have a different mold, which makes us, each of us, and our gifts necessary to fulfill the work of Christ in the world. Some of us may be talkers, others may be thinkers. Some of us are planners, others are doers. Some of us find energy while reaching out to the poor and the needy, and others while ministering to children through Sunday school or our youth program. Some are excited about music and preaching that draw people to come and worship on Sunday morning. And yet some others call us to go outside our walls to love and reach and touch those who are feeling shut out. We think differently. We are different. And that's okay. It's okay. This is God's design for us. God has assembled us into the body just how God wants it. Our task is to work to serve Christ in all that we do. So our molds don't have to be all the same. We just need to remember that our DNA is. In the first 11 verses of 1 Corinthians that we looked at last week, Paul talks about that our DNA and what makes us one. He says he acknowledges our different gifts. And then he reminds us that they come from the same spirit, which makes us one. We are all made of cells from the same body. And when we come together as the church, we are more than our individual selves. A miracle happens. We become from individual selves to one body. We become one. We are part of a glorious organism that serves Christ and represents us, Christ, to the world and his love to the world. So we may be shaped a little differently, but we are made of the same stuff. We are created in the image of God. We are all redeemed by the blood of Christ and strengthened and renewed by the Holy Spirit. All of us. And each of us needs to accept our role. Celebrate others whose roles are different from ours, and we need to work for the common good of our calling in the Holy Spirit. We cannot go on like we are and expect different results. Printed in your bulletin this morning, there's a picture, and I'm sure you, some of you have seen it before, and it looks like a bunch of simple dots, kind of randomly shaped computer-generated blob, right? And for the sake of the message, just bear with me and stare at those four dots right at the center of the blob for just about 30 seconds. Concentrate all your attention on those dots. Don't look away. Let the dots be all that you see. Just stare at the dots. Right now, just, let's all of us just close our eyes together. Do you see anything? Huh? Yes. What do you
What do you see? Did you suspect that? I'm sure you did, right? But it, isn't it amazing? Think about this now. Here, listen. Listen. Isn't it amazing how seemingly meaningless this collection of little dots can actually be leading up to such an amazing image? Think about that. Four little dots. And all those dots just leading up to an image. And all of us are always seeing a lot more than we think. You don't realize it. Under hypnosis, people can remember license plates, numbers of cars that passed them in the street weeks before. They can remember the color of a sales clerk's eyes who waited on them three weeks ago. Even when we are not consciously aware of it, our minds are taking in thousands of pieces of little information, processing them and, and generating fragments to give us a general impression of what life is and the, the basic concept of reality. Now, in Luke 4, 22, Jesus rose in the synagogue, um, his home synagogue of Nazareth, and the people were gathered there, and they were seeing a lot more than they thought. He rose up, and he stood to preach in, in, in the synagogue. Even though these worshipers were impressed with Jesus, um, his learning, and they reacted to his words with amazement. They could not take heart of what he was saying, it says. Right after Jesus says, today the scriptures have been fulfilled. He's standing up and preaching in his hometown, saying that I am the Christ. Today these scriptures have been fulfilled. And the synagogue people start murmuring, wait a second, isn't that Joseph's son? He can't be the Messiah. He was the boy down the street that was growing up. Because this congregation in this synagogue, they can only see one dot, one aspect of Jesus' being. They could not see his true image as the Son of God. They just saw one dot. Try looking at the pattern of dots that makes up the image you present to the world as yourself. What is that doubt? Consider that each time that you respond to anything or anybody that you encounter in life, your reaction is just one tiny dot. Every time you encounter someone, that one dot on an otherwise blank sheet of paper. And over the course of a lifetime, your piece of paper becomes filled with dots from all those experiences. If every time, every experience you had in a lifetime were registered as a dot, okay? What kind of pattern would those dots begin to form of your page, your life? What would that pattern look like? Huh? We need to take steps to help us make sure that every dot, every response we make reflects the living presence of Christ in our lives. If the church is the body of Christ, then each of us is a dot, a part of the composite image of Christ that the church represents to the world. So let me ask you, do people see Christ in you? Do they? I'm going to give you a couple simple ideas to try to make sure that people see Christ in you as we close. Try some of these simple ideas and see if people don't start to see Christ in you. First of all, make every stranger you meet glad to have met you. Have you ever known a person whose presence made everything different just when they come in the room or when they come into a meeting? Someone who, when he or she comes in, the spiritual climate of that room changes, who lifts the mood and the, the spirit of the meeting? So why not make it a matter of principle that no one who ever comes into your presence, no one who ever comes into your presence will leave any worse, only better. Make that a commitment. And then bring, bring peace to every meeting that happens. Medical doctor Gerald Jampolsky wrote a book a few years ago called Love is Letting Go of Fear. And in it he asked this question, have you ever given yourself the opportunity of going through one day, going through just one day, concentrating on totally accepting everyone and making no judgments. 
Have you ever had one day in your life where you've gone through one day concentrating on not making judgments on somebody else? Paul says, try not keeping score. That's what you want to do. Try not keeping score for just one day. Everything we think, say, or do reacts on us like a boomerang. And when we throw out judgments in the form of criticism, purity, and other attacks, they come back to us. And when we send out love, love comes back to us. Try it. One day, no judgment. This is the next thing. Say only nice things about people. There is a lot to be said for that old maxim. If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Keep your mouth shut. When you become conditioned to look for some good quality, some strong suit in somebody, and admittedly, it can be challenging sometimes, it is surprising how much easier it gets when you start looking for something good in people all the time. And here's the last one. Look for the image of Christ in all of creation. Many of you may not know who Ignatius is, but he is one of the early church fathers. And he once observed, he said, Consider how Christ works and labors for me in all creatures upon the face of the earth. If Christ labors in all creatures, then Jesus can be found in every aspect of creation. The family cat that wakes you up in the morning, the birds who sing on the fence, the flowers that spread their fragrance over your garden, the rainforest of South America, the mountains of Colorado, and back where I come from, Casper, New York, the children playing on the schoolyard, the homeless man fumbling for aluminum cans in his garbage bag, all sharing in the image of Christ. And therefore, they are both our responsibility and our joy. The body of Christ is brought into focus in, the, in one little dot at a time. For each of us who can manage to reproduce the image of Christ in the way that we love and serve the Lord in all we do and say, that picture of Christ grows a little bit clearer, a little bit sharper each day. So what kind of dots are you making? Huh? Are you producing dots that lead people to Christ? And is your lifestyle painting a, a different picture for the world? Are you? What are people seeing? What are people seeing in the dots of your life? Today, we actually call today is Ecumenical Sunday. You know what ecumenism is? And we celebrate the, the global church. And this week begins a week of prayer for Christian unity. And we see it on the calendars, but do we actually do it? We might just see results. So I believe it's right and good for us to begin with ourselves. Today, we celebrate our differences. And we remember the gifts of the Holy Spirit living in each and every one of you. They need to be used and generated for others to see them. My challenge and my prayer is that today, as a congregation, as the people of God, we will vow to work together to share the love of Jesus, to make our dots make a difference in this community and in this world with his power. Amen. Let's pray together. Jesus prayed that we would be one as he and the Father are one. And Jesus, you knew that it was only through the work of the Father that we would be able to come together as one people to serve one God. And you saw our unique parts and desired to make us one body. Lord God, help us not to see our differences as flaws, but as benefits. Help us to lift each other up and to be a light together to this dark world. Make us one, Jesus just as you and the Father are one. Amen.